All right, yeah, so uh, as Jules said, I'm Michael McKeown, and uh, I work for an emerging, or an emerging technology group at Red Hat, and um, we're looking at putting Apache Spark into cloud-native uh, situations. So what I'm gonna talk to you today about is uh, how can you monitor Apache Spark in these situations? And the first question is why do we wanna monitor Spark? And so, you know, it gives you a great way to introspect the applications that you're running to see how they're interacting with the platform that they're on and kind of like to get some metrics about what's happening. It's also a great way to tune the performance of your application. So you want, you want to see how your applications are actually running in the cloud. How can you improve what they're doing? How can you reduce time to, uh, to answers and models and whatnot? And also it's a great way to kind of look at when things go wrong, how, how do you kind of find out what happened? You know, you can look at the logs, but you know, how do you go deeper than that? How do you figure out where the stumbling points are in the applications that you're running? And so what about the logs? This is kind of where most of us start, and you can see here I've got a little spark submit command, I'm running some Python application, and I've got, a, I've got an exception trace. So it's an e this is an easy way to see when an application blows up, and maybe you're able to print out some information to the logs, but really you just see these logs when you're looking at these commands, or you're looking at the standard output from what you're running. And what we wanna do is go deeper and look at the metrics that are coming from Spark. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go through kind of the basics of how the metrics are set up in Spark, and then what are the default options that you can get just out of the box without adding anything to Spark. So to begin with, Spark has a concept of metric sources. And uh, what you're looking at here is this is kind of the base class for all sources that produce data. And, and what these sources do is that they emit values. And so we're looking here, this is something coming from the JVM source. You know, we're seeing how much memory is used in the heap, basically. And those values go to what are called sinks then, and this is the base class for all sinks. And sinks are a way to take your metrics out of Spark and then put them into somewhere, to publish them somewhere where you might get them. And so there's kind of a base level of configuration that you wanna do when setting this up. And really where this all starts is in the metrics.properties file, and I'm sure you know, probably many of you have seen this if you've looked in the configuration directory. Metrics.properties is great, and I give I give credit to the Spark developers. They've put a lot of information in that file, and so I would say start your exploration there because it's a great documentation tool in addition to what's on the, the docs website. And, and what we're looking at here is kind of like the, without configuring anything, these are some of the sources that you could turn on, and this is the base JVM source. So even without enabling these lines, you'll get some level of uh, metrics coming out of Spark, but turning these on will allow you to see what's happening with the JVM. And you can see kind of all the way on the left-hand side, you see like master, worker, driver, executor. There are ways that you can specify different sources and sinks depending on what process you're looking at. So whether you're looking at the master, or you're looking at a worker, or you're looking at your driver application, these are different ways you can specify what's happening. So as I dive into the different sync options that we have, I'm gonna assume that these have all been turned on in the cluster that I'm running. And the first uh, sync we'll look at is called the metric servlet. And this is turned on by default. You don't have to do anything. You may not have looked at it already, but it's already running on the Spark clusters that, that you're operating. And what you could do is you can make a, a restful get connection or a get uh, request to this URL, we're looking at a master uh, URL here, and what you'll get back is this kind of dump of, of metrics. And so we're looking, we see this like uh, JVM mark sweep count, mark sweep time, scavenge, you know, count time. I didn't know what these were when I started looking at these metrics. I, I'm, I don't have a deep knowledge of the JVM in terms of how it does garbage collection, but what I learned was this mark sweep is, is a garbage collector, and it seems to come up very frequently in the metrics, so I figured I, be I better figure out what this is. So in addition to this though, there are a couple other locations you could do these gets at. So metrics, app, or metrics applications JSON is another URL you can use off of your master to see what applications are running on your cluster. And then on any of the worker nodes or on the driver application, you could go to this metrics JSON and get a specific dump for that process. Now the next, the next thing we'll look at is the console sync. And the console sync, you can turn it on, you know, just go into your metrics properties and you kind of adjust these lines. These, are, these will be commented out, but you can turn them on. And what we're looking at here is, you know, on the left it says star.sync, star.sync. These are turning it on for all the processes. So for master, driver, application. And this just, this just lets us control how this sync will operate. And this is gonna dump things to the console. And you know, we're telling it, we wanna see this every five seconds, dump the metrics out. 
And what this looks like is, you know, as you'd expect, in the standard out from the console process, you'll see, you know, these metrics. And there we see our mark sweep again. You know, it's right at the top and scavenge. And we're seeing some information about the heap that's happening on this particular process. But, but the problem with the console sync is, you know, as you might expect, this is what happens when you're running. You just start getting these dumps out to your console. And so, like, you know, what, do you, what are you going to do with this? You're not going to sit there and monitor it. And it's just, it's all going to fly by really quick anyways. So the next, the next sync that you could turn on would be the simple logging for JSON sync. And, and this, is, this is really nice if you have a deep logging story in your processes already. So if you're already hooking into the logging mechanisms and maybe you're collecting those logs into a store, this, this might be a good sync to use. And again, turning it on is very simple. These, these lines are already in metrics.properties. You can just uncomment them and you know, change the period to whatever works, you know, however, however frequently you'd like to harvest those metrics. And then what you get up, what you end up, you know, getting for free basically is this output, and this comes out in the standard out again. So much like the console sync, this isn't by itself; it's not uh, hugely useful because although it's a little more structured than what comes out of the console sync, and, and it could be parsed in a more machine readable way, it's still just dumping to standard out if you're not using any sort of extended logging mechanisms. Now, there's also a comma separated value sync, and I think. This one to me is really interesting because you can produce a lot of data and store them in files and then post-process them later really easily. And again, turning this on is, is much like we saw in the other examples. You know, we kind of, we enable the sync class, we tell it how frequently we'd like it to run. But in the case of the, of the CSV sync, we can tell it where we'd like to place those files. And so this, you know, you'll have a directory and what ends up happening is you get, for each metrics value type, you end up with a comma separated value file. And so, Again, this is really cool because later on you could, you could run for a very long time and then ingest these metrics later and kind of post-process and, you know, you could even re-ingest these into another Spark application that could create some sort of processing for it. And what these files look like internally then, and here we're looking at our favorite, our favorite metric, the mark sweep count, which, you know, probably was a bad choice for this because it only ever instantiates one of these garbage collectors. I, I never saw it go above one. Um, but what you see on the left is like a time value, and then on the right is the, no, is the count. It, it, you know, it just stays one, basically. So there's also a JMX sync, and, I, and this kind of got me into learning more about the JVM. How many people here are familiar with the Java, the Java management extensions? Okay, so, you, know, so you, guys, you guys know about Java. These, these JMX extensions allow you to actually get a connection into the JVM and see what's happening internally with it. And again, this one's really easy to turn on. We just kind of turn this, you know, turn this one line on in our metrics.properties, and it's ready to go. But we also need to set some defaults in our Spark defaults configuration. And these, these are kind of informing the JVM where it will open the JMX port. And so you can kind of customize these to your own installation, you know, whether you need authentication or you need a different port to put it on. So this allows you to control it a little more. And then what ends up happening is you could use a tool like JConsole and you could explore the metrics using this UI tool. And, and this is just the window showing you kind of the beans that are being exported. And those beans kind of have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the metric sources that we see. So you can, you can kind of look through here and examine, you know, what, what metrics are you looking for? Maybe something's interesting. You can also look at, you know, the memory and the threads. And there's all sorts of cool graphs you can get out of it. But this really only works if you can get a connection to the machine and you know how to get there and you've got this J console and then, and then even then you're, you're not really automating anything. You're just kind of examining it on your own. And so there's a great project called Jalokia and it's a Java agent that will create a REST interface on top of that sync. And so as, as the metrics are exposed, you, ha you now have this really rich way that you can grab them and, and you can automate the tooling to kind of pull that. And when you, you know, to use these Java agents, you do need to add a little extra to the, you know, to how you're starting. So we're looking at the Spark class um, process here, and, and that would be used like if you're starting a master or you're starting a worker, then you would inject this Java agent command so that it could be running on those, uh, on those applications. And what this ends up looking like in Jalokia is that, you know, first you could do this get to the Jalokia agent, and you'll see information about what Java agent is running. You know, what version is it? What, you know, kind of how much memory does it have? Those type of things. And, you know, and that's, that's interesting, I guess, just to know what you have, but it's, it's not really interesting by itself. Now, 
with this REST interface, though, you can make deep queries. So instead of the metric servlet, where you're just kind of getting everything out of it, you can now make very targeted queries. And this is just an example of a GET request, but you can also make POST requests, where you can kind of layer up what you'd like to get out of it. And you see the request object at the top of this, you could feed that back in through the POST interface, and, and then you wouldn't have to kind of make this, you know, this huge URI to get what you want out of it. Now going you know, one step beyond that, there's the Graphite Sync. And Graphite is a project that combines a time series database with, uh, with an HTTP interface. And again, turning this on is, is much like the others. You, know, you go to your metrics.properties, you kind of uncomment these sync lines. But in the case of Graphite, you'll need to set up these extra processes. So you, you need to tell the Graphite Sync where it will be sending information to. And of course, you know, we tell it the period and, and how long we'd like to do that. Now this is kind of architecturally what you'll be looking at. In addition to the sync in your, in your process, you'll need to have Carbon, which is this database that will record everything, and then Carbon also needs the Graphite API. And so once you've got these processes connected to your Spark, what you can do is things like this. So this is, this is looking at a graph that was created by going to the HTTP endpoint and asking for HTML data, and what it sent me back was this graph that it created, and you can see, I didn't choose Mark Sweep here because it would have just been a straight line, so I wanted something a little more exciting. So we looked at the, at the heap usage, and this is just saying, for the last three minutes, what was the heap doing here? And, and there's, you can have it add more metrics, you can kind of create really kind of dense charts from this. And, and it's interesting, but I think what I, what I find most interesting is how you can use the, the REST interface. And here we're looking at, we can get an index to see what metrics does, are exposed on this interface, and then for each metric, much like the Jalokia interface, we can make these kind of deep queries to have it tell us, okay, what, what do I want to look at? What metrics would I like to know about? And in the case of Graphite, because you have a database there that's storing the information, what we're seeing here is actual data points in time. And so you can make requests to kind of limit that, or you can look at it for long periods of time. And this will help you to see metrics that sometimes disappear into the numbers. So, there's, there's kind of more to discover here, and I, I would encourage all of you to kind of like just look at the metric server and uh, metric servlet, and you can see these are some of the other um, just examples of other stuff you can, other metrics you can pull out. So at the top, you see those are application specific metrics. You can see, you know, the block manager memory, like what the code generation process is doing, you know, the DAG scheduler. And if you really understand how these programs are put together, and, you, and you're getting to the point where you're really trying to push performance, these will help you to introspect that and figure out where are the sticking points in my application. And there's one more sync that's in um, Spark, but you need to recompile it. It's the Ganglia sync. Um, I think it has to do with the GPL licensing. You know, you would have to recompile Spark. So I didn't really go into that one. But now, let's talk about how do we take this from our applications that might be running on a, a cluster that we have access to and how do we put it into the cloud? You know, how do we get access to this information when these things become cloud-native applications? And I'll start you know, with what is cloud-native? How many people have heard the term cloud-native or, or know what it is? Okay, so a couple people. So I'm using the definition that comes from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and uh, this is an open source foundation that's kind of sponsoring technologies like uh, Kubernetes and Prometheus and you know, other, other kind of cloud-enabled orchestration platforms and related technologies. And what they say is that in order for something to be cloud native, it should first be containerized. And then in addition to being containerized, it should be dynamically orchestrated. And, and what they mean by that is that through the containerization process, you should make your application dynamically available across clouds that support cloud native uh, types of you know, applications. And then finally, they also say you should build your applications in a microservice oriented way. And this is kind of a, this is a deep conversation about you know, what is microservice oriented, but I would encourage you to go look at uh, their website and they have, they have an extended definition of what each of these are and you can kind of learn a little more about how you might start to adjust your applications this way. And so what we've been doing uh, with the group that I'm at at Red Hat is looking at how can we turn Apache Spark into a cloud-native citizen. And so this is kind of a, what we think of about you know, traditional orchestration, right? You, you, maybe you'd have some giant cluster that you've, you've put all your compute resources in one place, and you have a resource manager that might be creating VMs or it might be creating containers, and, and we have a bunch of applications. And we can see our applications have, you know, 
a little code component, and they've got some sort of analytics component, and maybe they've got some sort of publishing or API endpoint, and we've got our data sources that all kind of feed into this, and what ends up happening when we run this then is that the cluster manager, whether it's you know, like Zookeeper or Luigi or some sort of job manager, our applications might be running, but they'll have limited access to who can do analytics at any one time. And this becomes, you know, I think we're all used to kind of creating these large clusters and you want to kind of centralize your compute resources, but in the world of, of kind of cloud native and I think moving forward into this, into this new orchestration world, what we're trying to do is take the cluster away from this kind of monolithic thing and bring them actually onto the orchestration platform. And so what you see here is, you know, we've turned the Spark executors into containers that live within our applications. And so in this respect, if this is a cloud native orchestration, then each one of these applications, every component is actually a separate container and a separate microservice. And what this allows us to do with the platform then is to allow the platform to determine when our applications should run based on their needs. And so now our applications don't have to kind of communicate with the cluster and, and kind of manage how they'll synchronize their usage of the analytics, they're just always running. And, when, and, and the resource manager can much more efficiently just determine, well, your application needs to run, and while your application's running, it's gonna need analytics, so we'll just turn it all on. So how do we, you know, what are kind of, what are, the, what are the issues with this? How do we get to the metrics once we've kind of turned these things into containers? Because, you know, if, if any of you have worked with uh, container orchestration platforms, it can get difficult to really get inside of the containers. It's much different than working with uh, virtual machines or bare metal. And so what I'm going to talk about now is cloud monitoring. And, and let's, say this is, let's say this is our cloud, or our cloud native application. And we've got this little blue piece that's you know, some sort of data ingestion code. And we've got a couple different analytics processes. And we've got some sort of API endpoint that we're distributing information on. And we've got a couple Spark executors. And these are, all, these are each containers on their own right, all kind of orchestrating together in a tight namespace. So how do we get the metrics out of this? One of the ways that we've been looking at is uh, like a scraping techniques, right? And this is a, a pull-based approach to doing this, where maybe you would enable the JMX uh, sync, and then what you would use is some sort of metrics collection service that could look at all the containers in your orchestration platform and then harvest metrics from them and collate them all in one place. And uh, you know, Prometheus is an example of a service like this, and it's starting to get integrated deeply into some of the, uh, into some of the cloud orchestration platforms. And so you can see some examples of this. Uh, you know, obviously the Jalokia project is gonna be really helpful to this because it'll give you that REST endpoint that you could just you know, kind of ingest traffic from. There's also a JMX exporter in the Prometheus project. So they've made a nice connector that will allow you to just kind of use this as your Java agent and then the JMX extension knows how to export Prometheus data. So Prometheus will be able to just kind of harvest the information at that point. And there's also a Fabricate uh, agent as well that they call Agent Bond. And they're building a piece that is kind of connects between JMX and then other types of export methods. So they have, a, they have a Prometheus export method from there and I think they're trying to add more methods as they, as they kind of become, I guess, popular in the community. Another way to look at this too is, is a broadcast methodology, right? And this is, this is a push-based approach. And there isn't a sync currently that does this. So you would have to kind of you know, do something custom. But what we're looking at here is something where you might use a stream broker service. So maybe you're gonna use uh, Kafka or AMQ or something like that. And you would have the metrics that you want pushed out of your container onto this broker service. And then, you know, of course, since it's on the service now, you could ingest it with other applications in other places. And there's, there, there is one example of this, uh, a colleague of mine, Eric Erlinson, who's down here in the front, he wrote a Kafka sync that actually you could, you could compile into your Spark, and then you can use that to export directly onto a Kafka topic. And this makes it really convenient to kind of integrate with that layer. Now, for me, this is where it gets really exciting, because you can start to get into hybrid approaches, right? As we're talking about cloud native, we're talking about microservices, you know, everybody loves to throw these buzzwords around, but how can you really push the limits? So let's say we change our cloud native application to where now, you know, we're using some sync, you know, whatever it happens to be. Maybe you write a custom sync or maybe you're using JMX or Jalokia or something. And we write an application that lives as a microservice within our app and it, it is looking at those metrics to do something, right? Maybe it'll send you custom alerting, you know, maybe you have it send emails or, you know, whatever works for how you're trying to build this. 
but something you could do that's kind, of, that's kind of interesting is you could take this to the next level and say, what if our application could actually talk to the resource manager in the effect that it can see when load is being placed on the Spark executor and then actually scale those things up dynamically so that you have some elasticity built into what you're creating. And at this point, your application is kind of self-contained. You're not needing to talk outside of there. And these components can be reusable. So you could, you could kind of create this one little piece that's like your, uh, you know, your scaling component that looks at the metrics and then does these type of things. And you could reuse it across you know, all the different applications you create as long as you create some consistency between the way that your, your syncs talk outwards to this application. And there's actually an example of this. Um, so our, our group has a community project called radanalytics.io, uh, and, and we have a, a code piece there called Scorpion Stare. And Scorpion Stare will actually connect to a graphite sync, and then it will talk to a Kubernetes underlayer, and it will, it will automatically scale up your clusters based on what it sees on the load. And what it looks at is, in the driver, there's a, metrics that kind of, there's a metric that talks about the number of expected executors that the, that the driver is planning. And so what you can look at in a very real way is you can say, if the number of expected executors is greater than the number of workers that I have deployed into my cluster, I can just start scaling out workers until those numbers balance. And, and in this way, I can really react very quickly to what's happening within my application. And so, you know, I've talked about kind of the upsides of all this and what I like about it, but there are challenges that you have to consider when, when doing this. And one of the big challenges is file storage, and this is a stumbling point for me when I use uh, some of the cloud native platforms, is that you, it, it's not that it's difficult to do, but it, it takes extra collaboration to set these things up. So if you want to have somewhere to store, like, you know, in this case, the comma separated value files, you're going to need to arrange, you know, where will this file storage be? How will my containers get access to it? And then how will I get access to those files later? And this is something that, you know, it might be part of the resource management platform you're using. You, you might have to use some sort of, you know, external file system, like, you know, heavens forbid, an NFS store somewhere. But, you know, you, you get the idea that you'll have to figure out how to arrange these things, you know, for your, for your sinks. And then another challenge is, let's, let's say you're using Prometheus with the JMX extension. So you've got Prometheus, it's actively harvesting data from your, from your cluster. Where does that Prometheus live? Does it live on your, on your resource management platform? Does it live in your application? And, you know, and how do you get access to what's coming out of Prometheus? And so if you're using something like Kubernetes, then Prometheus might be tied very coupled, or, or coupled very tightly to the, uh, to the platform. And you'll have to figure out, you know, how does this work if I'm just using a public cloud? How do I get access to that information? And so, again, this isn't, uh, this isn't difficult, but it requires more collaboration. And so it's something to take into account as you put these things together. And then likewise, if we're using the Kafka broker, I have to, again, coordinate where does that, where does that Kafka broker live? Where does a storage backup for that live? You know, do I have it living inside of, of the orchestration platform? Do I have it living outside? You know, again, this, this is another point where you can't just stay isolated. You're going to need to collaborate with others to figure out how you can overcome these issues as they come up. And then lastly, if you, if you do start to do things like create new containers and, and add things to your clusters, how will your monitoring solution know about those? And this is where you really get into understanding the resource management platform that you're on, understanding how it orchestrates containers, and how you'll be aware when new beca containers become active. And I think, you know, I, I know from, from the Kubernetes side, there are ways to kind of orchestrate this, but you'll need to understand at a deeper layer, kind of outside your application, how do I, how do I understand what the resource manager is doing with like new containers it creates and whatnot, and, and how will those fit into the monitoring story that I'm creating? And so, you know, I think you can see that the building blocks are all there. The pieces are kind of easy to put together. And so, you know, I, I leave it out to you. What, you know, what are you going to build with this? How will you put this together in your situation? And what, you know, what are you going to look at? How will you, how will you uh, tailor this to your own, you know, uses? And so, uh, you know, I'd like to thank you for your time. If you want to keep in touch, uh, I'm on Twitter. I've got a GitHub repository here where I, I dumped all the metric samples from all the syncs you've seen today, and I've got configuration information, so you can, you can see what it would look like if you were using each one of these. And then, uh, you know, I invite you to come look at radanalytics.io and check out our projects, and 
you know, maybe find something interesting there. So at this point, I guess, any questions? Thank you, Michael, for that insightful way how to <laughs> monitor your Spark applications. We've got five minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, please walk up to the mic because we want to record and make sure that the questions are captured in the video. So if you have any questions, please walk up to the mic, the two mics uh, by the camera side. Anyone? Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you guys have uh, come up with good solutions for keeping track of like business level metrics. So like, uh, you know, the number of records that you've processed or number of records filters or filtered or, you know, various cases like that. Um, so, you know, we've tried using accumulators, uh, but then in certain, uh, certain stages can either, if they need to be recomputed, uh, those accumulators will get double counted or, um, there, there are various cases where accumulators don't always work very well. Um, so I was wondering if, uh, if you guys have found anything within the Spark metrics uh, system or outside that allow you to keep track of those kinds of custom metrics. Well, so keeping track of it, I might not necessarily do that in Spark. If I were going to leverage the metric system, what I might do is create a custom, a custom source or a custom sync, right? So if, if you have the ability to know within your Spark clusters what what metrics you'd like to export, then what you can do is you can create a custom sync that, or a custom source that will export those metrics and then you could put them through the normal metrics process. So if you were harvesting with Prometheus or you know, putting these out onto a Kafka you know, stream or something like that, I think that instead of trying to do it programmatically from within you know, my driver application, if I wanted to do this across like all the platforms that I was creating, like you're saying, if I'm looking at billing information or something and I want to calculate you know, how much of this is happening. What I might do is instead of trying to have Spark accumulate those for me, what I might do is just have Spark export those for me, right? And then you could look at the metrics afterwards and calculate those things kind of separate from what's happening in your application. And so in that respect, you could start to shift the load away from doing this in application and put it onto the metric system so that you could actually have it separated and, and for me, that would start to kind of more cleanly approach the microservice kind of angle of this, right? Because you don't want to mix too much business logic in one place. Yeah, but I mean, so there are some things that you, you really just have to track from inside the application, right? Like, uh, you know, how much time did it take to make a certain call or, you know, th things of, those, of that nature. And uh, so even if you were plugging directly into the metrics layer from within the Spark application, uh, so if the task gets executed twice or, uh, you know, because of speculative execution or because uh, uh, something needed to be recomputed or whatever, you'd still end up double counting, right? I mean, yeah, I guess you could. It, I, I can see what you're saying. Like, the, the synchronization there would be difficult. And I, and I don't necessarily have an answer for how to do it in-app like that. Um, I think that the way that the metrics get, gets exported that I've seen is that if you, if you export like a singleton from the metrics, it won't keep appearing in the metrics. So I think for me, the idea would be that if I see like a value that I need to accumulate, maybe I would eject that once and then try to read it. But I, what you're identifying is a very real problem. Like how do you synchronize that? And, and you're right, you might, you might have a case where it's so tightly coupled to the application that you really can't effectively use a sync. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a clean answer for how you might do that from within the application. Were you more referring to doing application profiling of your Spark application to see exactly where the metrics are, are being monitored and how, uh, what's the resources it's taking? Yes, well, uh, uh, different kinds of cases, but uh, profiling is one example yeah. for sure, uh, but also keeping so, track of business metrics. Uh, again, like how many records did I see, how many records did I filter, how many records matched a certain pattern. And, uh, and, and like, I, I, you know, we, we take advantage of the, uh, the, the different kinds of sinks. Um, so, you know, we have some metrics going to one sink and, and other metrics going to different sinks. Uh, so the sync uh, solution works very well to decouple the actual um, upload of the metrics, but uh, it, it, we just have a hard time figuring out how to publish the metrics from the application uh, in, a, in a sane way uh, and then allowing those metrics to get, you know, published to the actual endpoint by the sync um, separately. So there are, there are application-specific metrics, you know, like there's these like code generation metrics and like individual application usage metrics, but it almost, it almost sounds like you're talking about something that's even custom beyond what, what's just happening from Spark. Yeah, I mean, 
You know, I didn't, I didn't, in the research that I did, I didn't get too deep into trying to export things directly from the application. Um, so it, it, it would really depend on, you know, what the resolution of the information you're trying to get is, and then how quickly do you need to react on it. So if you're trying to do something where you're getting a quick turnaround, like I see this application getting executed multiple times in a row, or I see this process getting executed multiple times in a row and I want to stop that, yeah, I mean, you, the, res, the, the speed resolution you might need there might go beyond what metrics can produce for you, and, and you might have to just use some sort of custom solution. But again, I think, you know, kind of in a larger story here that goes beyond just metrics and gets into more general monitoring, using a cloud native platform a lot, you know, will kind of push you in the direction of, of decoupling these things so that you could start to look at how could I create a targeted microservice that would look for this one type of metric that I want to export and then have it do something back to what I'm, you know, what I'm working on, or maybe send an alert somewhere. And so, I, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to talk more about it afterwards if, if you want to kind of explore other problems. But it, it sounds like you've got some deep issues there that you know, are really specific to what you're doing. OK, cool, thanks. Okay, that's, all, that's all the time we actually have. Give a warm welcome to uh, Michael McKeon. Thank you very much.